Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining. And we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. Now, today we are going to talk about Jamaica and Barbados, Jamaica versus Barbados and the International Monetary Funds Agreement. Now, we know that both countries are engaged in an agreement with the International Monetary Fund, this neoliberal institution located in Washington, D.C., now, what is often not said or is very silent has not been spoken frequently about and been publicized in the Jamaican media is that these two countries were countries that were deemed to have been very indebted. Barbados in 2018 was running a debt to GDP ratio of around 150% of GDP. Jamaica, on the other hand, in 2013 or prior to, you know, to 2013, was running a debt around 147% of GDP. Some say 145, some say 147. I'm not sure what was exact, but it is between 145 to 147% of GDP. So Barbados was in a higher debt, right? There was, Barbados was much more, not by much, but it was more indebted than Jamaica was. 150 is greater than 145 or 147. So that is a fact, all right? We know that that is true. Now, when Barbados entered, let's begin with Jamaica, since Jamaica started first in 2013. When we entered into the agreement with the International Monetary Fund, we seem to have had a projected agreement that we would bring our debt down, our debt to GDP down by 60% of GDP. So let's think about it. In 2013, we were planning to move, I think by 2024, 2025, we would have been at 60% of GDP. However, due to the pandemic, the International Monetary Fund extended the years to about, I think, four more years, three more years. And we have that target to reduce our debt 60% to GDP um, by 2028. Barbados entered into an agreement with the International Monetary Fund in 2018. And it's required based on the agreement, based on what I have read, right? It's required that they bring their debt down to 60% by 2034. So that was done in the, 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 the agreement was inked out in 2018 and Barbados was required to bring its debt down to GDP um, by 60 in, by the year 2034. So they've they had what 16 years in which to bring down their debt. Jamaica, on the other hand, had the IMF not extended, would have had 10, 11 years, it seems, right, to bring down its debt to GDP, while Barbados would have gotten 16 years. Now, what is the difference? Why the rush? Why is Jamaica rushing and even in 2018, Barbados was still a better off economy, was doing much better economically than Jamaica was doing in 2013. So why is Jamaica seeking to rush this sort of reduction of debt? Remember now that reduction of debt sounds nice to the average Joe. But for those of you who are not aware of what the IMF does, when they require that you bring down your debt so drastically, and significantly, it means, therefore, that your social programs right, are going to be impacted negatively. So it means, therefore, that you will not have enough funds to invest in education, in healthcare, in infrastructure development, in physical infrastructure development, and, and the list goes on. So the government is broke because the government has to pay much more money on debt servicing. What is not understood, though, as the debt begins to be reduced, which Jamaica has done and has done creditably well at doing, right? We have to give them their credit for following stringently um, the International Monetary Fund's rules and regulations, right? You have to give credit where credit is due, that they did what the IMF instructed them to do. But the question I've always asked, at what cost? It means, therefore, that it would have costed the Jamaican uh, people a lot because they would have had to bend their bellies, right? And they would not be able to um, live in their country and survive well. And that is why we're seeing a huge percentage of the population immigrating, 
right? There is a huge brain, brain drain in Jamaica. Um, and we, of course, are ignoring that to our own peril. But the fact of the matter is that the Barbados, the Barbadian economy, it was doing much better than the Jamaica's economy and has been doing much better from the start. You know, even when we had independence, they were still doing better. Barbados, you know, when Barbados became independent, had a much superior economy to what Jamaica had in 1962 when Jamaica became independent. So from the get-go, Barbados has been doing well. And if you want to do or delve into a deeper dive in terms of the history of these two countries, you need to read um, an article online. I think there was an article online in which uh, it's, it, it's accessible online, in which the Jamaican professor at Harvard University, Professor Orlando Patterson, did do a deep dive into the historic um, relations between Great Britain and Barbados and Jamaica and, um, and Great Britain in which we know that the British favored Barbados and was able to develop Barbados much more than it did for Jamaica. So when we started in 1962, we were way behind Barbados on every indicator, whether it be social indicator or economic or educational indicator. We, Barbados was way ahead, beginning their independence. And we were behind what we should have done then. We should have looked at Barbados in 1962 and we should have charted a path in which we would have either outgunned them or, you know, would have sought some form of equal footing. But the fact of the matter, we did not do that. We began to grandstand and we know that the elites in Jamaica are not particularly interested in developing the social and educational and economic development of our people. We know that that is a fact. And if you don't know that by now, then something is wrong with you. You're not thinking and maybe you are also entertaining too many views. And some people are saying, oh, we have to look, look, listen to many views, right? You've got to really grow up now and see that you have seen and heard many views in your lives. Those of us who are over 40, we need to understand that we're now in middle age and we have to make an analysis. Too many of us, we grow up into just being big adults, big kids, right? We're glorified young, um, well, I shouldn't say young, but we are glorified children, right? Because we have not grown up intellectually. We've got to grow up. We've got to understand and we've been hearing from the devil was a boy, that Jamaica was on the path to development and it has never been. So for those of us who have, God has given us years of experience and we are over 40 years old, which I am, then we should be able to make now the connections and see that the government has been lying, right? They have been lying through their mouths and they are not embarrassed, they're unashamed. Well, you know, that's how the, politi the, politi the politicians behave. But the fact is that there was a report in the, in the Observer and an editorial that was written. I think this was written some times ago. Let me see if I could, is it? Yeah, every time I have these things up, then you click on them and you don't know where they went. All right, so this was published. This is from the Jamaica Observer and it was published on November 18th, 2023. I think it was an editorial. Yeah, let me check to make sure. Um, yeah, I think this was no. It was actually it was actually a commentary written by Ambassador Emer Emeritus Audley Rodriguez or Audley Rodriguez. Yeah, I think it's Rodriguez. Um, served as Jamaica's senior envoy to Venezuela, so he is a, an ambassador emeritus, and his name is Audley Rodriguez. Now, um, he's writing an article, and he's saying here that the Barbados approach. Okay, let me go back to the top. He begins by saying, in recent years, it has become something of a fashion in academia, in the media, and at the national, regional, and international levels to compare Jamaica and Barbados. Comparisons are often made in terms of politics, policies, levels of development, quality of governance, international stature, and leadership. Jamaicans often read the comparisons and weep. While comparing nations is fraught and often invidious, it can be used if the right lessons are learned. And are we learning the right lessons? I'm not sure about that. Let's take this matter of public debt. 
both Jamaica and Barbados guided by somewhat similar political ideology and constrained by the same economic forces on entering into negotiations with the National Monetary Fund, started off with an identification of high public debt measured by similar debt to gross or gross domestic products, that's the GDP ratios of about 150%. So we started off on that same footing. I think Jamaica was a little lower than 150%. Barbados was as the existential problem. So the problem was that we had too high debt. Listen to what the guy is saying here, and he's correct. The objective arrived at with help from the National Monetary Fund was identical to reduce the debt to GDP ratio to 60%. Right. So we are both required or we were both required to reduce our debt to 60 percent of GDP, debt to GDP ratio. Right. I hope you're following what I'm saying. And the governments of both countries committed themselves to fiscal prudence. Therefore, in problem identification, in policy formation and in objective, there was little to distinguish these two Caribbean partners. It was in implementation. It was in implementation implementation being everything, or more precisely, the pace of implementation that the difference was most stark. So we started out, Jamaica and Barbados, on the same footing, right? We started out on the same footing in the sense that both countries were highly indebted countries, right? They were highly indebted countries, and they were required to lower their ratio, their G, their debt ratio to GDP, their debt to GDP ratio rather. I'm really mixing up the terminologies here, but they were required to lower, to reduce their debt to GDP ratio by 60%. Because Barbados was 150% in 2018, Jamaica was 147, some say 145% of GDP in 2013. However, as he's saying and suggesting, and he is spot on that where the two countries deferred was the fact that of the point of implementation. Now, in 2016, when Jamaica agreed a standby arrangement, SBA, load with the IMF, one of the primary objectives was to reduce public debt to 60% of GDP by fiscal year 2025 to 2026. So, by the way, it was not in 2013 in which they required, the IMF required that we reduce the debt to 60%. It was in 2016. So this, we are assuming, would have been under the Jamaica Labour Party's agreement. They would have endowed another agreement um, other than what was inked out by the former um, Minister of Finance, Dr. Peter Phillips. Right? So this is what you have to follow. Please follow me here now. So we were required in 2016 under this standby arrangement, the SBA, with the International Monetary Fund, to reduce our public debt to 60% of GDP by the fiscal year 2025 to 2026, by maintaining primary surplus at 7% of GDP for the duration of the agreement. Remember, when we started first, we were we had to use a primary surplus in 2013 of 7.5. And right now, even though we were paying our debt, the IMF could not even have lowered the primary surplus to us at least 6, 6.5, since we were in an agreement, you know, three years, um, you know, by we when we entered into that other agreement, that standby agreement, we were already in an in, in an IMF agreement for three years, three plus years under Dr. Peter Phillips, right? But they decided that they were not going to ease up. The IMF was not going to ease up. They just eased up a little because we had a, a primary surplus. We were running a primary surplus of seven point five under Dr. Peter Phillips' um, administration under his leadership. Now listen to what he's saying. In 2018, when Barbados agreed an extended fund facility, that's the EFF loan with the IMF, its debt to GDP ratio was in excess of 150%, the highest among CARICOM countries. The target date agreed with the IMF for bringing the debt to GDP ratio down or below 60% was set at FY 2033 or 2034. So they were required, Barbados, unlike Jamaica, was required to bring down, even though it was more indebted than Jamaica and was the most indebted in the among character countries, that's Barbados, it was required, based on their IMF agreement, to bring down their debt-to-GDP ratio by 60% 
by 2033, 2034. So that's from 2018 to 2034. That's about 16 years, right? While Jamaica was required in 2016 to bring down its debt to GDP ratio by 60 from 2018 to 2024, 25, they're about you know, a space of seven years. Why? So we had Barbados having 16 years to do the same while they were more indebted than Jamaica. And not only that, to compound the situation, we were already, by in 2016, we were already in an IMF agreement in which we were resilient, in which we were obedient to the IMF and their rules and regulations. However, to accommodate fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, that date was pushed back to, to 2035 to 2036. So Barbados has now by 2036 to reduce its debt to GDP by 60. Jamaica, on the other hand, and for the same reason, Jamaica's target date was also shifted by two years from the original 2025-2026 to 2027-2028. So by 2027-2028, we have to reduce our debt to GDP by 60%, while Barbados has until 2036. Right? That's a number way, you know, eight years. You know, do you know what you can do, eight years can do to an economy? Right? Barbados has much more wiggle room to ensure that they develop their social infrastructure, that they can invest in education, that they can continue to invest in education as they have been doing, and they can invest in their social infrastructure, like you know, physical infrastructure, also like roads and stuff like that. So what he's suggesting here, both countries were indebted. Both countries you know, um, needed the funds from the National Monetary Fund. But the implementation or the pace of implementation, as he has put it, was different. Why? Hmm? Why? When we know that Jamaica is the poorer of the two countries and that we are lagging years behind the Barbados, yet still we are hearing that the wizard, Dr. Nigel Clark, is someone who is doing great and the infrastructure is going to be developed. We are on a path to success, even though the Gleaner reported some days ago that in our next quarter that we're reporting a decline in the economy, right, for the next quarter or so. I don't know, but something is definitely wrong with the country called Jamaica, right? Something is fundamentally wrong with that country. And I think that it's a grand plantation. I've been saying that and I see, um, what's his name? The professor there at the University of the West Indies. The, um, I was reading his article today that we are um, actually Africans. <laughs> and rightly so, because we love to be exploited, right? We love to be exploited. We are not able to stand up and stand up to European power and the European power structure and say that, no, we don't have that sort of, you know, resilience and fortitude anymore. We just simply accept orders, even when they are unjust, right? Even when these laws and these principles are unjust, but that is how we are as a people. And then we go and we say that we are, we have all these titles and we're important when we are just slaves. Now, this was an article written and it was published in the paper or today. I think it's, yeah, that's an online edition. I think it could be coming from the out of the Caribbean or today. I'm not sure. I, I read articles from it. I'm not sure who is the publisher of this newspaper, Our Today. Somebody can tell me. But this this uh, article was written by Al Edwards, and it's entitled, Is Dr. Nigel Clark Too Preoccupied with Debt Reduction at the Expense of the Social Welfare and Development of Jamaica? That's what the question was asking. Let me share this article with you, just to, it's sort of, it, you know, it's always pale when I read, you know, uh, articles from this paper. But let's see how much we can read from it and look at it. You have to pay attention in the people because I don't think we understand what's going on. And the media, of course, is not reporting. Uh, well, we should give the observer, we should applaud the observer for having published that article written by the former ambassador, Ambassador Emeritus um, Rodriguez, Mr. Rodriguez. 
Jamaica has done a tremendous job, he's saying, in bringing down its debt obligations, and in this respect, is well regarded on the international stage. Right? We're well regarded on the international stage because that's what we're all about. The liquor with Talawa, right? Even though they have their sticks wielded over our heads and we're slaves, but we did come up with Talawa. Long gone are the days when Jamaica had a debt to GDP ratio of 147% and 64 cents of every dollar had to go toward paying down the debt. And that's what I'm saying. As we pay down the debt, why isn't it that we have more money to plow into our social and physical infrastructure? I don't know. You know, I mean, it's just a mystery. Progress has undoubtedly been made and Jamaica stands out as a good example of exhibiting fiscal discipline and management because it's almost like you're on the plantation and you have to beat the slaves for them to get the job done, right? And that is why, because we have the economic stick wheeled over our heads, we have to do it. Andrew Cordes, you have to do it. You have to do it because that is what the IMF dictates that you do. And that is what is being done. But at what cost? As we, you know, during slavery, and they were beating the slaves, they were lashing the slaves, and eventually the slaves had to revolt because too much, they had really gone too far, and people were not able to tolerate the exploitation that was done. Now, today, Jamaica's debt to GDP ratio is at around 75%. This article was written some times ago. I think it should be lower now, with 28 cents in every dollar earmarked for debt payments. Minister of Finance, Dr. Nigel Clark, says this is still too high. The mission now is to get the debt to GDP ratio down to 60% by 2028. As we have said in and shown lucidly by the ambassador, right, the, the ambassador Emeritus Rodriguez, he's suggesting that that is so, that we have to go down to 60% of GDP, because that was the agreement inked out in 2018 with a standby agreement, the, 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 the standby agreement that was um, issued by the IMF for Jamaica. Now, comfort is taken in 10 consecutive quarters of growth and continuous upgrades by the national rating agencies. But what growth? We had negligible growth, right? It was not anything impressive. I think if it were not Bruce Golding, it was somebody else who said, I can't remember the person, I'm not going to call names and the, per the right person is not being credited. But there was an economist or a prime minister or former prime minister who said that if we were to, if Jamaica is to benefit from growth, in terms of catching up with other countries, we would have to grow at a rate of 8% per, per year. And, per, and perhaps more if we were to catch up with countries like Barbados, at the Dominican Republic, and other countries which are growing in the Caribbean region. We would have to be growing at a rate of 8%. And all we hear is, oh, 2% and sometimes 1.5%. It, it has not been great. I don't think we have ever, since the Andrew Holness administration grown by 4%. Have we? 5%? You can correct me. I, I, I've never heard that, but maybe we did. But there, but even if we did grow by 4 or 5%, as I'm suggesting here, if we were to benefit from significantly and to, to put our economy forward, to push our economy forward and to be getting at an equal footing and to be at an equal level with our Caribbean, some of our Caribbean partners, we would have to be growing at a rate of 8% per, per annum. But there are those who say this one-dimensional approach and fixation on debt reduction does not allow for fully funded social welfare programs or the undergirding of the Jamaican economy with the national development projects. It does nothing to spur growth, which is true. It's growth for some segment of the population, the elites, but it's not growth for the people, right? It's not growth for the people. Now, we have business journalist Ralston Hyman has been an ardent critic of Dr. Nigel Clark's approach, but why is he an ardent critic when he was doing the same under Dr. Peter Phillips? And I'm sure he was an advisor or one of the advisors to Dr. Peter Phillips because, you know, Ralston Hyman is a PNP. But we don't see any much difference between the PNP and the GLP in terms of the administration of and implementation of the IMF program. We have not seen much different, Mr. Ralston Hyman. And the way he has uh, amassed surpluses while the country struggles with poor infrastructure, poor education, crime, and antisocial behavior. And you wonder if they're amassing the surpluses. Is that, do they really have surpluses? And if they are, if these surpluses are true, 
who is pocketing the sur surpluses because we are not seeing the surpluses you know being implemented in the economy right a few roads here and there and probably one or two hospitals being refurbished re being remodeled but nothing interesting nothing revolutionary is happening in jamaica as far as i know have you noticed something revolutionary happening there i have not he further buttresses his argument pointing to our Caribbean neighbor Barbados having a higher debt to GDP ratio. That's one fifteen percent falling by 14 percentage points last year, but a way higher productivity level than Jamaica and a functioning economy which incorporates national development projects. It has targeted uh, going down to 60 percent by fiscal year 2035 to 2036. So he's confirming that that is true. We have confirmed us, ours going down, even though we do not have any national developmental projects. We do not have any national developmental projects. We don't. We don't. Let's be clear on that. Just, you know, building up some, some high-rise buildings, which are owned by these foreign invest, investors, <laughs> does not mean that you are on a path to development or building some highways that are owned by these foreign investors also, and which you are paying for because they don't belong to you, right? You have to think. Looking further afield, Hyman has drawn attention to Japan, where its debt-to-GDP ratio is, whop is a whopping 250%, yet its economy grew by 6% last year. Dr. Clark may retort that 22% of its fiscal budget last year went on interest payments and debt reduction and that Japan has dropped to the fourth largest economy after, uh, after Germany with 30 years of deflation coming to an end. So he has made some good points here. The, the fact of the matter, however, right? The fact of the matter is that when these guys are out of power, so if Nigel Clark, you know, if he wasn't going to the International Monetary Fund and he was in opposition, if he should, if his you know party should lose the election, he would be saying the same thing, just like what you hear Doctor um, Ross and Hyman is saying. He would have been saying the same. Well, I don't know. I don't know if Ross and Hyman is 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 speech. I don't know, but the same thing that Ross and Hyman is saying, I'm sure that he would have been saying the same thing, because that's how they play the politics. But when they when the if the PNP should come into power tomorrow, then they're going to do the same thing. And the guy here was talking about you know we're an African nation we're an African nation ruled by European elites European and Arab Asian elites right that's what we are ruled by so we we can be African and African to you know but if we're not governed by Africans. If you, we are not governed by people who look like the ordinary people who look like me and, you know, the ordinary populace in Jamaica, then we can be African all we want to be African. <laughs> but in the boardrooms, when you go to the boardrooms, who control the boardrooms? European, Arab-looking, and Asian-looking people. They are the ones who control Jamaica. So all of this Heritage Month, and we're going to talk about our African, you know, identities and all of that nonsense, it means Nothing to the average Jamaican, absolutely nothing. So the people at the University of the West Indies can remain there and romanticize about our history and how much African we are. But if we are not ruling the nation, if Africans are not governing the nation, if they do not have the economic resources, and if they do not, I don't know, packing up the boardrooms, then I don't think that we are in fact an African nation, right? We are an African nation in the sense that, yes, the populace is predominantly, you know, African in terms of our phenotypical you know, appearance. But at the end of the day, who controls the economy are the ones who own the country. And they are really the true Jamaicans. Thank you so much for joining. Um, it was my pleasure, my delight to have shared my little thoughts with you. Hope that you have learned something from it. And where do you think we're think we're going with the, the the agreement with the International Monetary Fund? Do you think that it is fair that Barbados has gotten more years to bring down its debt to GDP, and Jamaica has gotten fewer years? In which I'm telling you, six years are a lot. When you think about the difference, six to seven or eight years that Barbados has gotten more than Jamaica has gotten, that's a long time. 
right, to get your act together and to grow your economy. And as Ross and Hyman is saying, and I think it is true that Barbados is, um, IMF loan is linked to national development. Ours is not. Ours is just linked to bring down debt and at what cost? All the best to you. See you then. Bye.